I'm going to be lecturing this afternoon on the minimum wage. And this lecture is meant to sort of illustrate what can be done with Austrian economics, the method that you've been uh, exposed to so far this week. And I've taught it several times in the past. It's been taught, I think, virtually every year of Mises University, and there's a lot of great uh, lecture content. Uh, but one of the things I felt is that I kept on getting drawn down further and further into the weeds of the debate and these paid for studies for all of the local increases in the minimum wage or state increases in the minimum wage. You know that there's been a lot of increases locally and by various states in recent years, even though the federal minimum wage hasn't been moved in like 13 years. So uh, we have made a little bit of progress, but not very much. And I think in much the same way that my lecture over time has been drawn further and further down into these weeds of these local debates, um, I think the American public has been dragged down uh, in terms of their understanding. And so what I want to do this year and this afternoon is to go back to the very beginning and to look at what was the reason for the minimum wage law? What was its purpose originally and why it was so very successful? Okay, when you look at the situation, you look at the history, uh, I would have to admit that the people who first advocated the minimum wage and why they advocate it, advocated it um, have been very, uh, very successful in pursuing their own political goals. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to completely dump the basic analysis or the more nuanced Austrian analysis of the minimum wage. But we do want to have some insight as to what the whole purpose of this exercise is. And when I say the American public seems to be kind of bamboozled about all of this, and they certainly are, 90% of Americans believe that the minimum wage, in contrast to what I've been talking about for years and years, they believe that the minimum wage should be increased. A majority of Americans think it should be increased to at least $15 an hour. Now, of course, if you set them aside and you ask them, well, if $15 an hour is a good thing, then maybe $80 an hour would be a great thing. Now, first of all, the minimum wage is obviously a political and leg legalistic phenomenon, and it's always been about regulating labor in the pursuit of the goals of those who are in power. Those who are in political power have used labor legislation and minimum wages uh, for their own benefit. Uh, the first attempt uh, at regulating wages was not to establish a minimum, but to establish a maximum wage rate in England after the Black Death of the 13th and 14th century. Uh, the king and the nobility wanted to have a maximum wage rate in the overall economy because so many workers died off that the market value of their wages was rising and it was taking all of the revenues of the landowners and the nobility um, as a result. Um, in the classical period, John Stuart Mill, who is known in here at least for his methodical inconsistency on matters would talk about you know how labor and wages 
are a market phenomenon, but then he introduced the exception to the rule due to the power of the factory owners that collective bargaining might be a remedy for at least England and its factories. Now, of course, lost in this period is the fact that Western civilization in Europe, England, France, Germany, and elsewhere uh, de first developed and flourished really for the first time once we get into the Industrial Revolution without any kind of real minimum wage laws economy-wide. So they certainly weren't necessary. They weren't um, viewed as a good thing uh, for developing economies. Um, and even in modern times, we can look at different political uh, areas, cities, regions, states, and we can tell that economic growth and economic development are much better in areas where there are no minimum wages or very low minimum wages. New Zealand and Austria in the 19th century used uh, minimum wages, but that was more of an attempt to advertise to get new workers to migrate to places like Australia and New Zealand. They had plenty of land, they had plenty of opportunities, but they had very little labor and they couldn't resort to previous attempts at things like slavery and indentured servitude, so they used advertising campaigns like, in, like establishing a minimum wage to attract labor and of course, that doesn't really uh, do much harm uh, to an economy. It's an attempt to sort of reach out, um, to attract new workers. Now, in contrast to that, what we're going to be looking at here today is the minimum wage movement in the United States, roughly 100 to 150 years ago. It, of course, it culminated um, about 80 years ago with the first federal minimum wage law. But this is something that was advocated and promoted and established at the local level, at the state level especially, and then only in the 1930s um, did we get a federal minimum wage law in the United States. And this was part and parcel or went hand in hand with the American eugenic movement. Okay, and the minimum wage was a stopgap measure not to encourage labor to come to the United States, but really as a way of keeping more immigrants out of the country. 120, 130 years ago, 100 years ago, one of the crisscross thoughts in the American mind was, hey, we've got this country and we've established a really good economy and we've become a world military power. Boy, we must be great. We must be successful. And success at that time started, the thinking started that it was genetically oriented. Okay, Mendel, Darwin, this genetic idea uh, survival of the fittest, all of these sort of pseudo-scientific thoughts were entering the American mind and the American academic mind of the time. And so their conclusion was, hey, us white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, we did it. It was us. It was being white. It was being Protestant. It was being, on, you know, coming from immigrants and, you know, a building this great country. And so they wanted to exclude everybody else. They wanted to create sort of a utopian version, their version of utopia uh, here on Earth. Uh, and their minimum wage, along with immigration restrictions and other restrictions and requirements, were designed to hopefully keep 
all of these new people, colors, and so forth, countries, didn't speak our language, uh, keep them all out. So that's what we're going to be looking at here today. And what we're, uh, in my mind at least, what we're going to find is that there are no clear basis at all in economics or ethics, matters of efficiency, matters of fairness, that support the idea of a minimum wage law. And in fact, all, in all of these criteria, uh, basically, they fail. Now, Murray Rothbard and other Austrian economists have written about this subject. It's interesting, and we'll see why. Murray wrote about this minimum wage, not a whole lot. Even in his book on the progressive era, the minimum wage is but one of many things that the progressives were up to in, in molding their view of what America should look like. Uh, but he has a short little section on minimum wage laws and unions. So that's an important thing. Even if you don't know what that means right now, uh, it's important. Now, in the current American debate, um, we sort of have divided ourselves into two categories. On the one side is the pro-minimum wage side of the debate where we need a minimum wage, we need to increase it, we need to expand the minimum wage for matters of survival, matters of equity, and matters of fairness especially. And again, like I said, 90% of Americans agree that there needs to be some increase in the federal minimum wage law. And then more to my point when I talk later in the week about inequality is the fact that currently it's the perception is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Now, you're going to get several doses, including probably right after my lecture, uh, to the fact that labor is really not doing as poorly as people believe. And in my lecture, that income inequality is not correctly presented to the American people. So the one side is very much for uh, increases in the minimum wage, and the other side says no. The minimum wage, it only creates unemployment, and it allows for discrimination in the workforce. And we'll see why that, why discrimination becomes a big problem. Now, the Austrians agree with this second group that the minimum wage does increase unemployment, but what I'm, again, what I'm going to try to show in here today is that the types of problems that you see in these empirical studies in Washington or San Francisco or San Jose, um, where the numbers seem trivial, um, sort of cloud over a much bigger problem than most people realize. And it, what they fail to realize is that Legislation cannot increase overall pay and overall benefits in an economy. It can really only distort and destroy markets. It can only distort and destroy jobs and employers. So we'll go back to the drawing board here quickly. Now, the minimum wage, most of this I've already mentioned. Um, it's a law that sets a floor, a minimum wage in the economy, and you, you can pay higher wages, of course, uh, but not lower wages, except with some uh, legal exceptions. And currently, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, and it's been that way for over 12 years. Uh, when I was born, the minimum wage was $1 an hour, goes to tells you how freaking old I am. 
Um, and my last minimum wage job was, I think, $3.45 an hour. And I thought that was great. It was a great job at a great wage, again, portraying how old I am, but I didn't have to do much work. So it was like a, a make work job. Um, and so I was very happy to get it. Increases in the minimum wage have been widespread during this period of agitation, political agitation from the media, uh, from academia, and uh, political rights groups, um, even demonstrations uh, for higher minimum wages. You've probably all seen this, the sign carrying activity where $15, you know, promoting the idea of a $15 an hour job is a fair wage. And then, of course, cities have increased their minimum wage. I think in Washington, D.C., um, the minimum wage now is $16.10, um, which seems pretty high, except there's you can't afford any place to live there. So um, it's kind of a mirage of a job. Now, here's the conventional economic analysis on a graph. Uh, this is a highly exaggerated graph. Um, it really only refers to a small sliver of the overall labor market in an economy, the, basically the unskilled or very low-skilled jobs uh, in the economy. And it starts with an equilibrium between supply and demand here in the center of the supply and demand curve, which tells us the equilibrium wage and the equilibrium quantity of labor, jobs. And so at that equilibrium wage, there's an equilibrium quantity of jobs given and taken. And so that market is in equilibrium in the free market. It's sort of harmonious in that anybody who wants a job at that equilibrium wage can get a job. So there's no conflict. There's nobody being kept out. There's no unemployment um, in the marketplace. Now, the minimum wage up here is a legal barrier. Wages cannot go below this bare minimum represented by the minimum wage over here. And on the horizontal axis, um, the quantity supplied increases from equilibrium. In other words, this higher minimum wage has brought more people into the labor force, but it's also destroyed jobs. Okay, so uh, this area along here is the unemployment caused by the minimum wage. Now, of course, this is an exaggeration. Typically, the minimum wage is not much higher than the equilibrium wage. And the amount of unemployment, especially when you look at the, compare it to the overall labor market, is relatively small in terms of numbers. The, the percentage of our workforce currently working a minimum wage job as of a couple of years ago was less than 2% of the overall labor market. So this is an exaggeration for visual effect right here, but it's just meant to convey, convey the conventional economic wisdom uh, concerning the minimum wage. So even amongst professional economists, you can get very different views on the minimum wage. If we walked over to the economics department at Auburn, you'd probably find you know, a few people who were against the minimum wage and a few people who wanted to have $15 an hour minimum wage. We don't even have a minimum wage in the state of Alabama. None. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, actually, several of the southern states don't have minimum wage laws. And that should also tell you something, or it will tell you something about the minimum wage. So, and then in between, I'm sure you'd find some people over there who would say, well, yes, I want to increase it, but I want to have, you know, a subcategory and I want to have some wages, subsidies for this group and, you know, training for other groups and, the, you know, the, the technocratic mind of mainstream economists would go into overdrive and you'd see a little smoke coming out of their ears by the time you got done talking to them. So there's all sorts of people, and if I had money to dole out to all of these people, I'm sure I could come up with a thousand people on one side and a thousand people on another, professional economists, who would give us basically the two views. And on the one hand, when asked what would the minimum wage do, you might hear something like, well, there's just no evidence that raising the minimum wage costs jobs. At least when starting, the starting point is, is as low as it is in modern America. This apparent defiance of the laws of supply and demand occurs because, quote, the market for labor isn't like the market for, say, wheat, because workers are people. Now, quote, any Econ 101 students can tell you the answer. The higher wage reduces the quantity of labor demanded and hence leads to unemployment. Clearly, these advocates of the minimum wage law very much want to believe that the price of labor, unlike that of things like gasoline or Manhattan apartments, can be set based on considerations of justice, not supply and demand, without any side effects. And so I said, you know, you can find a thousand economists on one side and a thousand economists on the other. So who said these things? That's Paul Krugman. And that's Paul Krugman. <laughs> Poor Paul, he said so much that he's just a constant target especially of Bob Murphy. Um, so that's the sort of current state. And Austrians find this current state of the debate very disappointing, uh, with one side saying minimum, law, minimum wage laws are necessary and critical, and the other side saying, no, it just causes unemployment and discrimination. But hidden in this debate are at least three critical Austrian criticisms of this technocratic, in this case, progressive mindset. And the mindset of economists and particularly statisticians. First of all, the US debate is in terms of short run analysis. They're only really concerned about the short run. What would the impact be in the short run? And they never, as far as I can tell, they'd never gone back and say, well, what has this done over the long run? Second of all, it's wage rate analysis only. Labor is a contract between employer and employer, and wages is the most important thing but it's not the only thing that a job involves, either for the employee or the employer. And third, it's statistical analysis, and this has some inherent weaknesses in terms of being informative, especially when you combine it with only a short-run analysis and only a wage and unemployment analysis. They're missing the general points that Frederick Bastiat, Henry Hazlitt, and so many other Austrians have made that you don't want to look at 
just the direct short run effects of a piece of legislation. You, want, you don't want to look at just the beneficiary of a piece of legislation, but you want to look at the impact of, on everybody in an economy, and you want to look at that impact over the long run. So it misses the entire picture of Austrian emphasis um, and it misses the whole idea that a job is more than just a wage and it misses the market process analysis of Austrian economics. And what I'm advocating here is that only the Austrian analysis provides a clear, correct method and theory that is consistent with the facts and provides a global understanding of the issue. Now, in terms of where this came from, well, it developed among progressive thinkers, and progressive thinkers were believers in eugenics. Eugenics, quoting from the slide, during the early 1900s was also known as American Mendelism eugenics or mainline eugenics, and it was a mix of scientific and pseudoscientific studies and beliefs popularizing the rediscovery of the work of Mendel and Darwin. Eugenical programs such as immigration restriction focused either on the elimination or foster, fostering of heritable traits. So if we can keep out you know, immigrants from this country or that country, we won't be injecting all of their inferior genetic traits and will be strengthening the genetic gene pool that already exists. We won't be watering it down, I think was a phrase they used quite a bit. Many of these people uh, believed in compulsory sterilization as a way to, to effectively get rid of the inferior populations who already exist. So they were for immigration restrictions, preventing people from coming in. For those inferiors who already got in, they advocated compulsory sterilization and what's called institutionalization. And I'm still not perfectly sure what that means, but it's part welfare, part race, racial colonies, and institutionalization of the insane, uh, the criminal, all that sort of stuff. So prisons of various sorts for this invalid uh, population. And I'm taking a lot of this stuff, not from Rothbard, uh, but from a guy, Thomas Leonard, who published a book called Illiberal Reformers, Race, Eugenics, and American economics in the pro progressive era, which is roughly 1900 to 1920, into the 30s. Um, and it involved all of the main top thinkers in American economics, but also sociology and history and uh, government, the bureaucrats. They all basically believed in this progressive approach to economic policy uh, that should be uh, racially based um, and uh, eugenics, this, this pseudo-scientific idea of eugenics uh, was a major part of progressivism and of course it was also of Nazism in Germany. And it was a central tenet of American economists so they would frame all of their economic policy into its conventional effects, but also, you know, would this advantage or disadvantage the longstanding domestic population, or would it disadvantage or advantage the weaker um, new people coming into the economy? Uh, so it was central. The American Economic Association, uh, Leonard quotes and references 
several presidents of the American Economic Association in his book about the fact of connecting the minimum wage to racial policy uh, of discrimination. And he says that this is the exact opposite of liberalism. There weren't a lot of liberals left in academia even back then, but liberalism as Austrians know it, classical liberalism, um, uh, primarily because it was racist and it was sexist. And it didn't make much economic or scientific sense either. And progressivism, you know, nowadays if you're a progressive, that means you're a modern American liberal to the extreme. But in actual fact, the progressive movement was kind of a conservative fascist type of movement. So they wanted to conserve the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nature of America. And so it's, it's not necessarily modern American conservatism, but they did want to conserve and promote this, uh, this whiteness and this Protestant um, Anglo-Saxon background uh, in America. So it doesn't even really hold up to dictionary definitions of what we think of progressivism today. It was, unless the progressives are, can be identified clearly as socialist and fascist, um, which you can do, um, uh, but progressivism is not what a lot of people think. And it's not scientific, even though it was done by scientists, but rather a normative and incorrect scientific view <laughs> It really didn't hold sway with Mendel's work, uh, Darwin's work. It was not really survival the fittest, even as I understand it. And I'm not a scientist. Um, it was just a giant crackpot theory of uh, what those people wanted at, the, at that time. In fact, liberals, again, as Austrians understand it, celebrate the benefits of diversity and inequality. And we're going to, I'll take a look at that in my next lecture. So they began with immigration restrictions. Uh, President Teddy Roosevelt claimed that immigration into the country was race suicide. And of course, there was, a, there was a big wave of Irish and then Italian, Eastern Europeans, and so forth um, in the 19th century and early uh, 20th century until they shut the door. Um, but it, it was, in their mind, it was race suicide to allow these people into the country. It was the greatest problem of the civilization as Roosevelt understood it. And it's all based on very du dubious reasoning. They wanted immigration restrictions based on race. Ultimately, they got based on nations without much rhyme or reason. Uh, Anglo-Saxons and Germans uh, were allowed in because of their purity, even though historically, you know, they, those were highly mixed peoples. Uh, in the area of generally northern uh, European Europe and England. And they even defined the Irish people as Alpine people. And I haven't done extensive uh, explorations of the Irish island, but I, I, I do believe that the Alps Mountains do not cross the English Channel and, and then the Irish Sea and onto Ireland. So... And their, their, their ideas about skull science, which they thought was great. You know, the head's got to be big and it's got to be nice. It's, it's got to be like all of our other heads and faces. Uh, and if you didn't have a, a big head or, you, or your, your face looked different, that was a sign that we didn't want you. Uh, but, of course, that was shown to be 
scientific nonsense. And I just put Edward Atkinson and David Wells here because um, there were so few people in my reading who turned out to be good guys that I thought I'd put them in my notes so I can go back and read more about them. So the, the immigration restrictions were enacted, but they didn't really do the job. Um, they shut the door uh, of immigration after the fact, so the horse had already gotten into the barn or something, and before they shut the door, so they were left with all of these people that they didn't want. Um, so the minimum wage was the next best solution. It replaced immigration restrictions and literacy, literacy tests, uh, but it allowed discrimination in the American workforce. So if you had a high minimum wage, you had, like on the graph, you had more people applying than jobs that you had available. So you could pick and choose who you wanted for the job. Okay, that surplus unemployment was allowed employers to pick and choose. So they could pick white men for the jobs and they would, by discrimination, exclude blacks, minorities, funny looking foreigners, uh, women, children, uh, so on and so forth. And so progressives viewed it as helping the race and removing the, they called these people invalids, as a general category. And the minimum wage would help deter migration and detect the unproductive. Unproductive meaning racially or genetically unproductive. So this was good for the racial health of the country and all of the progressives and all of the leaders of the American Economic Association agreed. And this also helped them discriminate against women, to keep women out of the workforce, because women were in the workforce. They were 45%. Oh. They were 45% of the professional workforce. And so they were definitely in the workforce before any of this happened. And the progressives wanted them out. They wanted women in the home procreating the race. They didn't want them being bound up with a job. So they enacted maximum hours. They invoked in, invoked minimum wages and even stipends for unmarried women with children to keep these women, these pesky women, out of the workforce. Richard T. Ely said there should be no night worker jobs um, for women because it was injurious to the female organism. Interesting way to put that. Uh, but the idea was to protect white male jobs from women, from children, and from particular immigrant groups like the Chinese. Uh, by setting wages higher than equilibrium levels, they allowed employers who were almost all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants to pick people of that looked in the same as they did. So there was this mothers of the race argument that we had to keep women in the home. And I was going to read this quote by Ross on page 179 of Leonard's book, but I decided I couldn't do that. Um, so when looking, when Austrians look at progressives, um, they don't understand uh, the issue uh, and that the current debate focusing on short-term, wage-only, and statistics disguises the issue, um, doesn't really look at discrimination. And we look at the long-run discrimination, we find the unemployment rate over this long period of time was 
The worst ever during this 50 years was 10%. The best ever was 2.5%. That includes blacks and minorities. If you look at the black labor force, the worst unemployment was 20%, twice the overall. And if you look at black teen unemployment, the worst period was 50%, more than twice the black population, uh, black labor force, excuse me. So clearly what we're seeing if we isolate the black labor force is much higher rates of unemployment due to discrimination because of minimum wage laws and other labor regulations uh, in the economy. So that's the long run effect, systematic and po powerfully painful to minorities. Um, minimum wage effects in the longer run. This study found that minimum wages when you were young had continuing negative effects as that, that cohort of labor worked its way through its lifespan. So if you were disadvantaged or discriminated against because of the minimum wage early in your life, in your teens, that would have a carryover negative effect throughout the rest of your career. You weren't likely to reach managerial levels uh, within the firm, for example, until much, much later, if at all. And this study pinpoints that effect, that longer term effect, stronger for blacks on the minimum wage. And the, these negative effects are more significant than the contemporaneous effect on use that are the focus of much of the policy debate. So it has a long run effect. So just because you're disadvantaged of a, as a teenager, it does mean the disadvantage lasts over time. So Austrians are gonna be looking at a lot of different things with respect to the jobs um, and you know, that there's more things uh, related to the jobs, vacation and sick days, which I'll uh, come back to. But there's also the, old, the, the basic idea that these studies are looking at cities, a type of industry like restaurants, and they're looking at unemployment, employment over the short, very short run. There's just a lot more factors uh, that can come into play that are going to give you the wrong results because of your narrow focus. So, you know, the famous um, study in 1994 that said an increase in the minimum wage can increase restaurant jobs was seriously flawed in its basic approach. Um, but it's been cited a thousand million times, um, and it's still an argument today. Ah. Okay, and a higher minimum wage can actually lead to lower compensation. There was a study done and published in the Harvard Business Review that looked at a, a a chain of fashion stores in California and Texas. In California, the minimum wage was going up, and in Texas, it stayed the same. And so what they found is every dollar increase in the minimum wage in California um, led to lower, lower overall compensation. So there were more workers. Employment went up but all the workers on average had fewer hours. So their checks, their monetary compensation actually went down as a result of increases in the minimum wage by 14% for every dollar increase in California. And they went on to look at workers who got 20 hours or more, 20 hours or more before the increase and 20 hours or more after the increase. And they found that the people who had 20 hours or more, that number fell by 
And as a result, they lost all of their retirement benefits, which don't get included in the wage, but can come and go according to the employer. If the employer needs to attract workers, they offer more benefits. Uh, but in response to the minimum wage increase, they offered less. And with 30 hours or more, they saw a 15% decrease in that worker population. And that, if you lost, if you went below 30 hours a week, you lost your health care benefits. So the monetary reward fell by over 20%. And then some workers in this larger pool actually lost their retirement benefits and lost their health care benefits as a result. So that almost all of the payments that employers had to make were offset by all of these compensation changes. And then they also had to work more shifts for shorter hours, and the shifts were more variable. And it made it very, very difficult for new mothers and people with other obligations to maintain their jobs. So job tenure at this company went right down the toilet. So the big picture is the progressives wanted this minimum wage law, and it was fairly effective in promoting discrimination against disadvantaged groups, particularly immigrants, particularly minorities, uh, blacks, Hispanics, and so forth uh, in the economy, and that those populations have been disproportionately institutionalized in things like welfare, the percentage of black population who has um, on welfare at any one time or on welfare at any point in their life is three times higher than the white population. The population of black uh, Americans who have been incarcerated in prison or who are incarcerated in prison now is up to 10 times higher than the white population. And of course, that greatly diminishes your, your ability to prosper in the marketplace if you've been, quote unquote, institutionalized um, as a result of these laws in the government and what they've been intending to do. Their intentions may not be the same anymore, and not everybody has those intentions, but that was the original intent. And I think we need to know that and realize that and exploit that um, because Austrians view these things as completely unnecessary. They're only distortive. They're only harmful. Uh, and that the free market eliminates unemployment with the exception of frictional unemployment, which means you're quitting your job to go get a better job. And we're perfectly OK with that. Thank you very much.